Welcome everyone to the beginning of World Consumer Rights Day week. Um, a very warm welcome from Consumers International. We're starting an amazing program uh, with this session on fighting scams, deepfakes and misinformation in an age of generative AI. We are con convening under the theme of fair and responsible AI for consumers and we are beginning with a critical and urgent topic uh, mm -hmm. before covering uh, a series of in-depth issues ranging from data policy to consumer yeah. protection and ending the week with a celebration of fair mm -hmm. and responsible AI and what our members are doing to achieve that in different places around the world. So thank you everyone for, for joining us. Uh, my name is Stefan Hall and I'm the Director of Digital Innovation and Impact at Consumers International. I oversee the digital consumer rights portfolio. The context for today's discussion, uh, aside from the, the obvious uh, World Consumer Rights Day program, is that financial scams are costing consumers over a trillion dollars a year. It's an urgent and global issue. In the US, yeah. the FTC has just reported that consumers are losing almost a billion dollars per month to financial scams. So we have some, uh, some background noise. I'll just ask uh, for that to be muted before I continue. Um, the, the problem is often underreported. So the, we know that many consumers don't bother reporting uh, that they've fallen victim to scams because they don't believe that anything can or will be done to recover their money or hold those accountable, uh, hold those responsible accountable. Um, this challenge is becoming more problematic. The ability to produce deep fakes is getting easier, and the quality of those of that content is is also getting better. A uh, recent example from Hong Kong showed one company that was scammed out of Hong, 200 million Hong Kong dollars through a meeting of its own employees featuring a deep fake version of its chief financial officer who had instructed them to transfer money into, into a, a, a fake uh, or scam account. Um, at the same time, this issue is magnified by the series of elections that are taking place in the world this year. We have nearly half the world's population engaging in an election this year, including eight of the 10 most populous nations on the planet, from Bangladesh, which has already had its election, to India, as well as the United States towards the, the end of the year. So the risk of dis and misinformation is, is particularly uh, problematic and magnified, um, especially this year in 2024. And that's why Consumers International has brought together this brilliant panel to cover these topics and more. We'll be uh, engaging with four brilliant experts and consumer advocates covering civil society, uh, government and business. And this is part of the thread of an exciting set of discussions running all the way till Friday. And I hope you'll be joining many of us uh, throughout the week as well. So I'll get started by introducing uh, the panel. Um, we can begin with Rocio Concha, who's the Director of Policy and Advocacy and the Chief Economist at which our member in the UK. And Rossio is also a, a member of the Consumers International Board. I'd also like to welcome Hayley Fletcher, the Director of Consumer Protection and Director of the Foundation Models Review at the United Kingdom Competition and Markets Authority. We have Scott Knapp, Director of Worldwide Buyer Risk Prevention with Amazon. And last, but by no means least, Rob Weissman, who's president of Public Citizen, based in the US. Uh, I'll also flag that one of our advertised speakers, John Duffy, unfortunately was taken ill and can't join us today. We're sending our best to John, and uh, thanks everyone for, for your understanding. So I think we can jump right into to the panel. Um, I want to start the conversation by turning it over to, to Rossio. What we're hoping to do is start by discussing scams in broad terms. So we're covering some of the causes and, and the state of the problem, um, and also dealing with, with some examples of how, uh, how this is being addressed in different ways. 
So if I'll start with Rossio, Rossio, please just tell us a little bit, what is the state of the scale, state and scale of the problem of scams that consumers face and how have uh, different business models supported the proliferation of, of scams? Uh, thank you, Estefan, and it's brilliant to be here to discuss um, this uh, very serious issue. So scams is a big and a growing problem for consumers. And you, in your introduction, you mentioned the scale of the financial loss for consumers uh, in 2023 was 1 trillion globally, uh, consumers globally lost 1 trillion because of scams. But one thing that I want to stress is not only the financial impact, there is also an emotional impact. And I don't have a global figure for this, but what I can tell you is when we look at the UK and we look at the how scams impact uh, the victim's well-being, we calculated that this was equivalent to around seven billions per year. And much, much higher, by the way, that the financial impact in the UK that at the same point was 1.6 per year. So it's a huge problem, it's growing, it's going to grow faster, and we are going to discuss how because of generative AI. You mentioned, you asked me, or asked me about the business model. There are a number of business models that these um, criminals use to scam people. Uh, an example is fast payments for example, but the criminals use the convenience and the speed that in some jurisdictions, in the UK, for example, you can make transfers in your bank to, uh, to explode, manipulate people to make that transfers quick, and then you cannot reverse that transfer. So that is one business model. The uh, criminals also use online platforms. So social media platform, uh, search engines to get to us. So for example, pay for advertising. So criminals use uh, post fraudulent advertising online, for example, fake investment, uh, which are very, very effective because you think about the number of people that are uh, using social media and search engines. With one post, you reach out a staggering amount of people. So it's a very lucrative business for, for, um, for criminals. Criminals also use telecommunication companies um, to get to us. The common denominator of all of this is the lack of verification and due diligence that these um, businesses are being used for criminals, exploited by criminals to get to us. Uh, are putting in place. So there is no enough verification. Why uh, online platforms, all online platforms cannot verify when uh, an organization reach out to them to uh, for pay for advertising, why they cannot verify that it's a genuine company. Um, domain register, when, they, when an organization wants to register a domain, why there is no enough due diligence to verify that it's a genuine domain. So there is a lot that can be done on that. Then there is not a business model, but this technological development that we are seeing with generative AI, which, as I said, is going to, or is already in grow, growing the scale. So we are going to see far more scams, but not only that, we are going to see more um, credible scams and more effective in, uh, getting, uh, in getting victims. And we will we will come to to some of that in a minute as well. Uh, it, it's great to have the the initial introduction of, of how we start thinking about this and preparing for it. You, you've alluded a little a little bit to the responsibility um, question. Um, so where do you see this the burden of responsibility lying now? It's clearly not with consumers, but where would you like to see more uh, action being taken? Well, absolutely not with consumer, but I will tell you why because these are. These, these are organized crime organizations that are producing something that look really real, you know, fake um, impersonating um, uh, websites, that impersonate real companies. That it's impossible for consumers 
to, to uh, identify that this is a scam. They are very credible. And with generative AI, again, it will be even more more difficult to differentiate what is fake versus what is real. So while you know organizations like us keep alerting consumers about the new scams, it's impossible for consumers to protect themselves. So going back to your question, who is responsible for this? Well, absolutely the companies that are the channels to get to us. So banks, telecommunication companies, online platforms, um, domain registers. I will argue now also uh, these companies that are producing these large language models, the fake tools. Again, they need to think about how they can protect consumers. I think that there is also a role for governments, um, obviously, that, that responsibility shouldn't be voluntary. It should be a requirement, but also there is an opportunity to share intelligence more between government and these uh, companies um, and enforcers of the law to make sure that we are uh, identifying and preventing the, those scams uh, happening. Thanks for that really comprehensive uh, overview. I hope that members and participants listening are understanding uh, both the scale of the problem in terms of financial and emotional impact, but also some of the root causes. And I'm grateful that we've got uh, Amazon here because Amazon is doing all the things that you've just mentioned. Uh, you know, they they benefit from the ease and convenience of our digital economy, uh, but also are possibly, you know, a channel where, where consumers can fall victim to, to some of these issues. So turning it over to Scott, please tell us a little bit. Again, we're still in the state of the problem area here. So what are some of the common methods that, that Amazon sees to scam uh, and harm consumers? Uh, what should what should we be aware of on platforms like Amazon? Sure. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Stefan. And uh, once again, I'll echo Rocio. Thanks a ton. Uh, really happy to be a part of World Consumer Rights Day and kicking off the celebrations of that this week and the panel here. Um, Got to say, very timely choice of topic from my perspective. Just last week, we published our blog, that, like a path that we see around how to maybe tackle scams. I'll certainly touch on some of that, but would encourage this audience to go take a look at and give us feedback. Because um, as even Rocio mentioned, it's a whole. It's going to be a lot of, a lot of people who are going to need to engage uh, to get this solved for consumers. Um, you know, everybody's you and Rocio have already mentioned this, the staggering size of the problem. You know, this whole trillion dollar plus and that it's worldwide. Um, it's just, it's everywhere and it's going to need everybody. What we see um, at Amazon, although the store itself is safe, bad actors love to exploit consumer trust by impersonating entities people might know and trust, uh, utilities. Heck, I had somebody pretend to be my power company uh, just last week <laughs> trying to get me to engage. Um, but banks, merchants, and Amazon. So last year, uh, um, just around two-thirds of the scams our customers told us about were related to either fake account issues or ordering issues. Um, I'm sure folks have seen things like this, like you get the, someone may have gotten into your account, uh, please click here uh, so we can help you. You get that kind of text message, or you get the infamous, did you order this? And then they put in some kind of expensive item like a smartphone or a tablet to get you concerned that you're getting ready to be charged something. Because they're basically running an old con game, pretending to be someone you know, surfacing a problem and offering to help you with it. <laughs> uh, you know, and their objective is to get you to engage with them and see what they can get out of it. It may be as basic as just credit card fraud where they have you click on it you know, and give up give up some credit card information thinking you're being helpful. Or we've seen uh, it can be super complex and lead to ex extremely large cash handouts. Um, I, you know, some may have seen there was a really great piece in New York Magazine a couple of weeks ago, uh, Charlotte Coles, who was 
<clears throat> a writer for them, she outlined her unbelievable experience that started with a basic, hey, there might be a problem with your account. And before you knew it, she was talking to a fake representative from the FTC and then talking to a fake uh, person pretending to be the CIA. And then $50,000 was out the door. I mean, it's really, it's a heck of a read and you can actually really feel the fear uh, that she had while she was going through that whole experience. Um, and that kind of leads to the other thing we ask what we see in the scam world. One of the big things we're also seeing, and this isn't new, but we see victim embarrassment. Um, and <clears throat> it's because of this incorrect societal assumptions on, you know, the you should have known better. You know, you read about it and you're like, oh, that would have never happened to me. And the reality is very much different. Age, education, experience, savvy, doesn't matter. Our data shows scamming is a very equal opportunity crime. <laughs> and one group is not more or less likely to fall prey to it. And this can be really hard to detect when it's actually happening to you. Uh, you know, they hit the right hit the right emotional button with you. And then before you know it, uh, you're done. And bad actors, as Rocio mentioned, are only getting more sophisticated uh, with this about trying and how they're pretending to be people. Um, you mentioned there was the one note, Global Anti-Scam Alliance had the note, and they said that 60% of victims experience emotional or psychological distress, even beyond uh, the financial part. And you know, I, we feel pretty strongly we got to get out of this path of stopping blaming, stop blaming victims and start supporting them. Uh, besides it being the right thing to do, it's if we can shed that stigma, we'll get more people to report the crime. So then we can go after stopping it at its source. So the the state of the problem is clearly clearly underrepresented and under underreported. Uh, no está totalmente 100% representado. The, the things that you're talking about, Scott, uh, they're things that are happening now, and they show just how easy it is to fall victim um, to different types of of scam. Uh, For you, you talked a little bit about generative AI and what role that's going to play. You said it's going to make this problem worse. It's going to make this problem bigger. Tell us in a bit more detail how that is going to play out. You know, if it's already so easy, what what's coming down the line that consumers uh, uh, will be facing in, in the not too distant future? Well, I can't tell you what we know because you know, as you know, generative AI co continues surprising us uh, about what is possible. But LLM models can now be used very effectively to produce very targeted content to individuals to manipulate you. And remember that there is also a lot of data about us online that can also be used for this. And these models are accessible, accessible to everyone. I will give you an example, something that I came across recently. I don't know if you and others have heard about WARM GPT, W-O-R-M GPT. This is a chatbot tool that have been developed um, to help cyber criminals to produce phishing emails and other, uh, you know, and other things to get to to get to victims. So you can see how that is already being used. And by the way, you cannot. It's not that you find this in the dark web. You find it in Google. If you Google this, it's the first things that you find. I just find this incredible. Why Google is still allow advertising for this? So. So that is one. Then we have deep fake, which obviously are still evolving video and voice. Voice is far more advanced. So now you need what, five second um, recording. So all of us can, our voice can be cloned now very easily again to manipulate people, to pretend that we are, you know, that they are, we are loved ones and to say that it's an emergency, you have to transfer money. So these are samples on how generative AI, and we are not talking about science fiction here. What I would like to see is these tools are very powerful 
for for you know for scammers. But these tools are also very powerful for regulators, for companies. Why there is no more discussion? Why there is no a lot more interest in using these tools to actually prevent and protect consumers uh, uh, from a scam? Yeah, and I hope I hope we will uh, be able to address some of that today, at least some of the emerging solutions, knowing that there's a lot more to be done. Um, the we we know that there are clear frameworks for financial fraud, for financial scams. These are illegal. Um, Rob, if I turn it over to you, we we theoretically have the frameworks to to deal with that type of uh, of fraud and scam. Um, even if the scale is going to make that problem bigger and, and more difficult to, to keep track of. Do those frameworks work for the other examples of harm that, uh, that are going to be unleashed on consumers, uh, the other types of manipulation? What do we do about those? Can you give us some examples of what they might look like and where you think uh, we need to update our frameworks? Yeah, great. Um, thank you so much for having me uh, join the panel. and. Um... Nice seeing everybody, uh, at least metaphorically, and because uh, we can't see you. And um, I think a very important conversation and really appropriate for for World Consumer Day. I think on the in the area of scams narrowly, um, where we're seeing that generative AI is enable as as Rocio was saying is enabling people not just to do the same thing better, but to do different things. So it's one thing to impersonate by claiming to be something. It's completely different to be able to impersonate by showing yourself and sounding like the thing you're impersonating. It is a qualitatively different thing. And that's in the area of scams. And in the US, I would say, I'm pleased to be able to say, because we don't usually get to say good things about our regulators. Our regulators are, are addressing that issue in the context of scams and are adopting new rules beyond the existing rules just that forbid scams and fraud. I think you, it is important around the world to have overlays of um, legislative or regulatory protections that are specific to the new kinds of problems, even if they're sort of in the broad category that generative AI is creating. But as your question prompts, we're going to have to see big harms from the same kind of misuse of that technology outside of the narrow context of scams. And I think where we're going, and we're and this is not going to just be sort of dodgy operators. This is going to be mainstream companies. Where we're going in the not distant future, and again, I think this will be global, um, in rich and poor countries, are um, generative AI pitches to people that are targeted on an individual basis, presenting to you, the individual customer, in a specific way based on the data that a company has about you. So you may see a person, but actually that's an avatar, who is designed with skin color, with language, with affect, with selling technique, all of which is targeted to you and which adjusts in conversation in real time based on how you're responding and based on what the AI knows about you. Then it reaches out to the next person, whether it's through a, an affirmative outreach phone call or a text message or whether you're interacting with them over the internet. And the presentation is completely different, again, based on the information about that specific consumer. So that poses a kind of challenge that our regulatory systems are not equipped to handle and that we as consumers are not equipped to handle. What that will be is what will feel like a conversation, the kind of conversation you would have with a salesperson. But it's not really a conversation about between two equal human beings. It is an unequal conversation between you, the real live human being, and an AI powered seller, which doesn't have the, the weaknesses and foibles of a human, but has all this information about you. So how we deal with that is gonna be a big challenge going ahead. I think the first thing that is very important in this space is a legal obligation that whenever a consumer is dealing with an AI, 
in any form, whether it's a chatbot or an avatar, a voice, anything, that they're always told and aware that they're dealing with an AI. So they're not fooled into thinking they're dealing with a live human being because your guard is going to be a little bit more up if you know you're dealing with an AI um, and you're going to engage a little bit differently and you'll at least be able to some extent to protect yourself. That's not enough for sure, but I think it's a first step. Yeah, that's a, a very practical suggestion, uh, especially in the context where only half of consumers, according to research done by Stanford, only half of consumers are actually able to detect the difference between AI written text and uh, and human written text as just one one instance. Um, so I'm going to turn over to Haley now because Rob has talked a little bit about the uh, regulatory frameworks. He's he's said that he's pleased to see some progress in the US uh, on this issue, although there's clearly more to be done. Haley, you've you've undertaken a review at the CMA of foundation models, which are the models driving many of the generative AI applications uh, that have been released and will will probably continue to uh, to be available for consumers in the coming years. So tell us a bit about that review. What did that uh, what did that show about how it intersects with other issues of consumer protection, and uh, and what are the priorities now for regulators going forward? Great. Well, well, firstly, thank you very much um, for having me. Um, it's a it's a real privilege uh, to be a part of, of World Consumer Rights Day. So thank you very much. Um, as you, as as you said, we conducted a, a review last year. Um, and to really try to understand the impact of foundation models of which generative AI uh, is a part, what's the kind of impact that that's having on, on both competition and the way that markets work and the outcomes that they might be um, delivering uh, for consumers. I mean, sort of really focusing on what we found out about the, about the consumer experience, it was obviously in this such an early emerging market, there are a number of ways that, that this, can, this can go. There are a, a wide range of positives for consumers um, from using these new tools. It can make existing products and services much better. And it can, it, you know, if, if a market's working well, it can innovate and produce new services that consumers will value. But as, as other people have, have already mentioned, uh, we have to be really alive to the, the risks um, and, and, and that can have take a number of forms. So as some people have mentioned, generative may be used by, by bad actors um, to generate really convincing, whether it be phishing uh, content, um, deep fakes, you know, and fake, fake reviews. And what sort of, you know, can accentuate some of the issues there is, you know, is just that when you're engaging with these, these tools, how human sometimes they can sound and how much they can resonate with people, you know, in addition to, um, to being personalised. Um, and in particular, we understood that um, the models themselves um, can, what they call hallucinate, which is present uh, false and misleading information. And that's something that can happen, uh, you know, quite randomly uh, with, with, with the models. Um, so I think some of these some of the other comments we've heard, it's really important that consumers really understand when they're engaging with AI and they know how to use it, you know, but equally that it's it's harnessed for good in the way that, um, you know, others mentioned, you know, generative AI may be used to generate, say, something like fake reviews, but there's also potential that could be used to find them and tackle them and prevent consumers from being, um, from being harmed um, from that kind of, of conduct. So as, as, as you would have, you know, I guess we really want to sort of make sure that we have a market that's working as well as it can so that consumers can make the most out of generative AI. And as part of our work, we proposed seven um, key principles. Um, and the, the two that I think are, you know, are most relevant here are, you know, transparency, making sure that everybody has the right information about AI and how it's being, how it's being used, in how it might be good, but also where it might falter. Um, and that's also important that transparency is throughout the chain between firms as well, so that firms have the right information that they can pass on to, um, to their customers. Um, and to pick up on an earlier earlier point that was was made as well, uh, accountability, and you know that applies you know throughout the value chain. Everybody playing 
their part to make sure that these systems are are safe and that consumers can get can get the very the very best from them. Um, you know, but but equally that where things do go wrong, that that firms are being held accountable. Um, we hope that these principles, you know, getting in there early at, at a market as it's really rapidly evolving, we hope that these principles help as best we can sort of guide guide the market towards the very best outcomes for both consumers but also for competition. Thank you. And yeah, we're yeah. we're entering the solution uh, space a little bit, which is great. Um, Scott, coming back to you at Amazon. Um, what have been some of the tools that have worked for Amazon uh, that that you know do protect consumers? Um, give us some examples of of how you've integrated some of those into the Amazon platform. Um, sure, I think um, the most useful tool <laughs> that we have uh, is consumers themselves, and that's uh, and telling us uh, when um, something has happened because we think. You know, we strongly believe that stopping scams at the source is going to be the most effective strategy. So when people tell us what's happening, um, we can action it. Like last year, we took down 40,000 websites, 10,000 phone numbers uh, kind of thing. One, a single report last year led to um, a referral to the Indian government enforcement, law enforcement, and several people got arrested. A bunch of equipment got seized. Another piece there is us, us sharing data with Microsoft and the Central Bureau of Investigation in India. Over 70 fraudulent call centers got taken down. Um, so I know you asked specifically, hey, what are we doing or what do we see that works? It's information works in helping to stop scams and people being taken advantage of scams. So if, you know, Consumers can share uh, with us or with someone, and then we can work across sector to get that information sharing. Um, that can be super impactful. Like we've seen already, you know, the cross sector collaboration that the UK online fraud charter, you know, endorses, you know, the anti scam alliance in Australia also going down this path. So like real government efforts are happening um, to try to get this. Um, if I do go to really specific to to what we're actually doing that a consumer might see, uh, education is a big piece. You know, I mentioned it's it's naive to for anyone to believe they can they're going to be able to recognize every single thing that gets thrown at them. But we feel like we can arm consumers better. Like we publish trend scam trend reports and you know notify about here's what we're seeing and to watch out for. And we can adopt better practices, for instance, like we'll, we've taken on, we will never ask a customer to pay for something in gift cards <laughs> over the phone, for instance. That's a very common tactic for bad actors. But so con consumers can, can know what, to, what doesn't look right at all. And then um, the other thing that I think we're working on is around victim support. Is the other thing that we're doing. Um, you know, worked with the Better Business Bureau here in the U.S. to develop a scam recovery toolkit uh, that a, that folks can access. And then we've also stood up our own specialized teams uh, at Amazon to to try to help victims that for people that do end up uh, getting victimized by these uh, at the end of the day. Um, but I think, like I say, I, I got to go back to my number one thing: that tool that we have is information. Uh, and then we can go to work. So uh, it's great that you've shared that. Uh, I, I, I'm going to push you on it a little bit. Um, but just, just before I do, I'll, I'll remind those listening that there is a Q&A function. Uh, if you're interested in hearing something in particular from our speakers, please enter it there. And we'll have a moment to come back to that uh, after, after the panel. Um, so yeah, Scott, you've talked about you talked about education. You talked about sharing information, uh, both within Amazon, by the sounds of it, and also with other tech tech platforms. And you've talked about offering victim support, which is clearly very important. I think a lot of our members would feel that um, that places a lot of reliance on the consumer themselves. Even if you can help them improve, you're still dependent on them. Uh, you know, following this really rapidly changing 
landscape of scams and then being able to feel confident in a reporting mechanism, which may be on Amazon, might be uh, more effective than others, other platforms. But, uh, but overall, we know that consumers don't really feel uh, that, uh, that empowered by reporting mechanisms. I think you, you actually cited the, the data from, from GASA itself that 60% are not reporting it. So it feels a little bit like there is a lot of emphasis on consumer responsibility there. Um, and uh, it was uh, Robert who talked about some of these tools actually being available to um, to regulators and to uh, to platforms. So, do you integrate any of those, you know, generative AI tools to help you surface these issues without being entirely dependent on on consumers? Uh, yes, is <laughs> the shortest answer. More uh, one, I just want to make sure. The 60% number I was quoting from GASA was around, not around non-reporting. I don't actually have a good number for that. The 60% was victims who have emotional and psychological distress beyond just the financial piece. I I, I don't doubt that scams are underreported. <laughs> uh, I, I certainly just don't uh, have something there in terms of uh, how, how bad that underreporting might be. Um, we do see thousands of reports uh, <clears throat> a week. So we get something, but to your question around the way that we use AI is we do deploy it to specifically look across those reports and others where they may not be thinking they're reporting a scam. So we can pull out and then know where to go look and then do the investigation, for instance, and be able to then work cross and stream with it, whether it's with a telco provider uh, or someone else to be, like I said, that's, we don't take down 40,000 websites ourselves and phone numbers ourselves. We have to work across them. Um, and the information sharing piece does, is a work in progress. That is not a solved problem by any stretch. Don't let me, I don't want anyone to walk away with that. Um, we are all in on trying to help figure that out and share as much as we can uh, and figure out, hey, what are the frameworks we could get that, do that. And another piece there is this whole global nature. I kind of referenced a couple of, you know, great governmental things being done. Rob mentioned, hey, the US has got something in flight when it comes to this scam space we also it's the international flavor and cross-border cooperation we're also going to have to solve um <clears throat> that's one thing i mentioned the amazon and microsoft thing us working with the government in india you know we are we have a luxury or requirement i would say of approaching it from a global perspective and so we're able to, at least internally, make solve that global information sharing, uh, but we're also trying to work to solve it more broadly as well. Thanks for the extra detail there. Um, Rossio, when you spoke at Congress, uh, the Consumers International Congress in December, I think you described the UK as the fraud capital, the scams capital of the world. Um, so the UK is, is in a way, a very challenging place for this problem. Uh, but at the same time, which and others have made perhaps more progress than others, uh, in, at least comparing globally, in addressing the issue. So where do you see uh, action being needed now? What have we learned from the UK? Um, what what additional measures do you think are needed, both in the UK and globally, to, to start to address this? Yeah, thank you. By, by the way, calling the UK the scam capital of the world was not something that I come up with. Others are, you know, it's quite a well-known um, statement because, for example, we were one of the first countries to introduce fast payments and we are an English-speaking country, so all of that facilitates scams. So as you say, uh, this has been a big problem for the UK for many, many, many years, and we have campaigned for many, many years, and we finally get in some legislation in place in some areas. I mean, we have learned a number of things. I mean, the first thing that we have learned is what we seem to be all on the same page here, which is the answer to this is no more education 
for consumers. This is sophisticated. It will get even more sophisticated. It's impossible for consumers to protect themselves. So you need to put the right protection in the channels that are being used by criminals to reach out to all of us. And by the way, even people that are experts in this space, that read about this space, have been victims of scans. So this is the level of sophistication that we are talking about. So protection needs to build into the systems. That's what I was saying. The systems of the online platforms, the system of the telecom communication companies, the system of the banks, domain registers, um, all of these channels that are being used by consumers. The other thing that we have learned is that voluntary uh, measures don't work. We start with voluntary measures in uh, the banking industry in relation to authorized push payment scan. Well, guess what? There was no a lot of creativity, a lot of banks voluntarily putting measures in place. Now that we push for legislation and now we have the legislation in place, now you can see a lot more creativity, a lot more discussion about what intelligence we should be sharing all of us, you know, like the banks, the online platforms, the telecom to prevent this. So far more interest from these companies to really protect consumers. So as I said, there is some improvement in the UK. I think that, you know, the UK is moving in the right direction. We have now banks are responsible and uh, to protect consumers. Um, we have also search engines and uh, social media platform. Also, now there is a legislation to make sure that they have the right protections in place. It will depend on how the regulator really implement that legislation, but now have the power to implement it to protect consumers. But there are still major gaps in terms of telecom, uh, telecommunication companies, uh, as I said, domain registers, and, and as Scott was saying, there is huge need for this intelligence sharing, not within only the online platforms, but also between the banks, telecoms, the government, the law enforcers uh, to share intelligence because these, these criminals operate in all these ecosystems. So if they go to one and you catch it, you identify it, you should be sharing it with the others to make sure that they are, oh, okay, these characteristics are suspicious, so how we can stop this? And also, by the way, using the amount of data that is available, again, why there is no more creativity about the use of data and a use of generative AI to prevent crime? There is a lot of data there that you can do clear verification. So for example, in the UK, the, uh, uh, the um, FCA, that is a regulator of financial service, services publish data where our companies are registered that the right companies to provide us financial services. And now some of the um, online platform use that to verify when people want to put, for example, paper at the times and for example, for investment to avoid uh, investment um, scam. So, um, so as I said, there is still quite a lot to do. Nothing of that sounds impossible or too difficult. What we are missing is the lack of uh, the lack of interest. There is no enough interest, and I, this is why I'm saying that voluntary measures are only useful for as a transitional while you put real regulation. So you spark that creativity to say, oh, let's think about how we can really uh, solve the problem. There's a lot, a lot to dig into there. Um, I will pick up on the the comment you made about voluntary re regulation. Um, and and go back to Rob because in the US the the Biden administration has uh, introduced an executive order on AI, uh, but there's also been a a White House roundtable where a lot of the so-called consumer protections are being applied on a on a voluntary basis at least initially. Um, so from the point of view of public citizen, what what do you think has been good about those things? Uh, perhaps from a, you know the content and the substance uh, of those orders and discussions, but also what's missing, what's needed for better consumer protection there. Yeah, I'll try not to be too U.S. specific in terms of reflecting on it. 
the so you're absolutely right. The, the Biden administration has helped facilitate a, a series of voluntary commitments from the big AI companies. Um, that largely reflects the fact that it's really hard in our Congress right now to pass legislation on anything, even when the parties agree. It's really hard to get it passed. Um, so although there are efforts to try to do that, um, and they, they actually have a chance of succeeding, they'll be modest and you wouldn't want to bet on it. Um, so I think in that context, it makes sense to try to do what you can from the, from the Biden administration point of view and get voluntary commitments on a range of issues from dealing with political deep fakes to caution in the introduction of new um, large language models and some commitments, loose commitments for, for safety measures. Um, they only go so far, but they were fine to do against the backdrop of not really being able to do legislation. Um, they have also issued an executive order, which is the president using the, the authority he's got from existing law to direct regulatory agencies to do things that they can do under existing law. And that is an extremely detailed executive order. Um, it has a couple hundred specific commitments that it makes some of which are very tiny, um, some of which are pretty consequential, none of which go as far as the US, as these regulatory agencies could go if they were given new legislative authority. Um, but that deals with a whole range of issues from, from labeling of generative AI content to dealing with discrimination and the application of AI for decision-making to dealing with profound safety issues around critical infrastructure and a lot more. So there's a lot there for people who want to sort of see a laundry list of things. The U.S. is nowhere near, for example, where the European Union is with, AI, with the AI Act, not really where China is with its regulations. But the administration has put out a long list of specific things that are useful to reflect on. Uh, but a couple of just last quick comments. In terms of specific consumer protection things, Our, our key agencies are doing what they can in ways that I think are pretty. ولكن الكثير من الشركات تقوم بأمر كبير. والذكاء الاصطناعي أيضا يروج للتزوير ولمحاربة التمييز ضد المستهلكين وضد. As well, for example, using AI to make. ولكن أيضا بناء على access specific kinds of healthcare. Now, that's a problem the U.S. has that other countries won't have because we're so backwards on healthcare provision, but it's something that's happening in the United States um, and, a, and a lot's going on. And then last thing just to say is to come back to your uh, your prior question, Stefan, is I think, and, and echoing what Rocio said, I think that for a variety of reasons, voluntary commitments, while they're fine, are not <inaudible> We need binding rules. This technology is getting way ahead of where what our regulatory controls are. And we need governments around the world to do what they can to catch up. And the rules have to be as specific as possible and as binding as possible. And I think for good companies, that's actually desirable. Companies don't want to take measures that put them at a competitive disadvantage. But if everybody has to play... And if we're talking about in the area of scams, trying to facilitate communication between law enforcement agencies and companies or between across companies, that's a hard thing for companies to do. Um, sometimes it's not even it's questionable whether it's even legal. But if the law says you have to do it, then it enables companies that want to do the right thing to be able to do it. So over and over, I think we need to be focusing on on binding commitments and not viewing that as a burden on companies, but using that as, viewing that as a way to both protect consumers and enable good companies to be good and to force companies that are laggards to also be good. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. Um, if just before we close this part of the discussion and, and I'll, I'll try to moderate some, some of the Q and A in a minute, uh, yeah. I'll give the sort of last word to Haley. I think it's a nice, a nice little segue there into the role of uh, regulators and enforcement agencies. So Haley, you, you talked also about the, the voluntary um, commitments and the principles um, at the moment. What 
what tools does the CMA and organizations like the CMA have at their disposal, emphasizing Rob's point that there are many existing laws and protections already in place and remedies available uh, for, for consumer harm? Um, so how is, how is the CMA thinking about that in the context of generative AI? Absolutely. So our proposed principles are, are just proposed at the moment. We're getting quite extensive um, feedback from stakeholders on whether they are the right ones. Um, but what they're intended to do is, you know, in a market like this that is in its infancy, to guide it towards good outcomes from the outset. And they cover, as I said earlier, on both competition um, and consumer. But absolutely beneath that, we have, uh, you know, our existing you know, statutory powers, whether that be, um, you know, on the competition side or consumer protection. And, and our parliament is is currently considering enhancing our, our powers so that we can find firms um, if, if they are if they are in, in, in breach. So I think it's a, sort of a, it's a dual approach is just trying to make sure that, you know, from the outset, the market performs well, uh, particularly for, for consumers. And I just wanted to sort of emphasise there that I think we tend to have conversations about competition and consumer protection quite separately, um, but they can, you know, reinforce one another. So kind of, you know, open competitive markets where, you know, firms are trying to win customers and they have the right incentives to develop the safest products, you know, provide the, the best information to consumers, you know, really good interfaces, that kind of, um, uh, of thing. You know, competition there enhances consumer protection, but also consumer protection. If you have consumers that are, you know, engaged and can genuinely trust products and services, they can help uh, bolster, bolster competition. Um, let's say these, you know, these are principles about really trying to help guide the market. Um, but, but absolutely, like, like all regulators internationally, we do have you know, other, other levers that, that we can pull um, if, if necessary. It's going to be very interesting to see how how develops with this with these sort of uh, soft guardrails at the moment, but uh, increasingly firming up around the world, uh, not not just in the UK but everywhere. Um, I'm going to. It's a very fast moving situation. Yeah, it, absolutely. And I think what what's positive and optimistic about this is to see that uh, the challenge of AI and generative AI is being addressed quickly, even though obviously there, there's still a lot to be done. Um, one of the lessons possibly from the last 10 years or so with social media was not waiting too long to, to respond to when problems do emerge and exist. Um, so that's an, an optimistic direction. I will do my best to um, direct some of the Q&A that has come in. Uh, I will try to identify the panellists, but any speaker that wants to provide a response, just uh, wave at me and, and I'll bring you in. Uh, do let me know. We've got a lot of great questions here from from members and and others. Um, I want to focus on one, which is on uh, vulnerable consumers and in particular those with low literacy rates. Um, Scott, you said that this is a kind of a problem. The problem of scams it it knows no uh, no boundaries when it comes to age or or literacy or so on. Um, is there anything available for helping consumers that are, you know, sort of just coming online in many regions? Uh, this is uh, the access to the internet and growing access to platforms is something that actually puts them at more at risk because they, they haven't been exposed to it in the past. Um, how do you see that problem uh, and, and challenges and solutions to it? Yeah, I, I think it's a great question. I think that my advice there would be that what I would <clears throat> like anything that we I shouldn't say like anything like many things um, we should be skeptical upon engagement and I say that you know as a as a you know a company that goes into new countries and needs people to engage with us <laughs> as part of our business model um, however uh, you know skepticism can be healthy. Like I said, we believe we have a very safe store that folks can interact with, but that doesn't mean as you're going through the brave new world, if that's, you know, if it's a brave new world for you to be in the in online commerce uh, space, you should be super skeptical. I, you know, I tell 
my off the cuff thing is to tell people to, you know, pause before you click, text, or call anybody um, and make sure you understand, you know, think through, does this make sense? Should I be dealing with it? I know it sounds super rudimentary, but like you're bringing up a, you know, a very entry level example, which is real. I get it. Um, and that's our advice would be to be very cautious about interacting and then go to sources, for instance, that, that's a big thing that all of us try to do is, you know, that if you want to interact with Amazon, you type in the address to Amazon and go there. Uh, you know, don't go to a list of search results and click on something, for instance, uh, would be other advice I would give. Rocio even brought up, you know, right now, sometimes bad stuff ends up in search results. But most of us, you know, Rob mentioned the good players in the space, our, our sites and such are safe. But you got to know you're dealing with that. And so that kind of requires a little bit. Um, I get it's imperfect. You know, it does put some burden on the, it puts the burden on the consumer. Um, but until we can stop them at the source, I think that's where we are, is that uh, as they're uh, interacting with the world, we need them to, to be that much more careful until they start to learn the space. Thanks. I think that's uh, partially answered one of the other questions that has come in, which is advice given, what advice would we give to consumers to not fall victim uh, to scam? So that's one of the things that you've you've just addressed there in your answer. Scott, but but Rossio, um, any perspective on that? Uh, any response yeah. you'd like to give? No, unfortunately, I'm going to be very boring about this, but um, we produce quite a lot of advice. We have a scam alert service that every time that we uncover a new scam, we immediately, the people that are subscribed to that, we tell them, be careful about it. And we will keep doing this, but re the, realistically, the only way to stop this is to focus on the prevention. And I just, I just feel really, I mean, frustrated sometimes because it takes so much time to, for the authorities to realize you need to act now. You cannot wait. I mean, competition will provide, competition will not provide to, to support, to protect consumers. You have not provided on scans for many years. So we really need to feel the urgency to protect people and pretend that yes, we can protect vulnerable people. We cannot, yes, we can tell them, but we are talking about very, very sophisticated tools that are being used. I mean, we, we published the psychology of a scam, a research that we did um, on this. And to be frank, all of us are vulnerable because they are very effective to manipulate you. If someone calls you cloning the voice of you know, your kids or your parents saying that they urgently need money because something horrible happened to them, you know, you are vulnerable in a situation and that, that will be exploited and you will be evicted. So, yes, obviously we will continue alerting people as far as we can quickly as we can, but until we take really seriously, I mean, really seriously by the regulators, by the government, and by these companies that are being used to reach out to people, we are not going to be able to protect not only people that are vulnerable today, but any of us, because we all of us are vulnerable in a particular point of our time. And there is a lot of data about us, what we are searching online, that actually can identify our vulnerabilities. And guess what? What is frustrating is that the criminals are more creative, are more creative than the companies and the regulators and the government in protecting us. The, the criminals are more creative in exploiting us than the, the regulators and the government and the companies are creative in protecting us. And that is what needs to change. Thank you. Thanks, Rocio. And it's okay to be boring, I think, uh, on this issue especially. Um, we need more boredom and, and less um, less uh, excitement. Um, we've got a comment and question from our member in Mexico, Tech Check, um, which I think also covers the the question of global solutions or regional solutions rather than a national approach to to this problem. Um, so I'm, I'm going to read out the whole thing because I think it's interesting. 
There's widespread acknowledgement that sharing intelligence among consumers, industries, and countries is crucial. Global corporations like Amazon have the advantage of adhering to international standards. It's a question for Scott and Robert. So I'll probably start with Robert here. Do you think it's viable to establish a consumer rights commitment in the Americas? So from, uh, it says from the US to Latin America, I'm gonna include Canada, which is where I'm in today uh, as part of that. Um, can we establish a consumer rights commitment spanning the Americas similar to the consumer rights directive in the EU? Uh, Rob, is that is that possible? Is that uh, that's a very ambitious and exciting uh, solution? What do you think? Um, I think the United States will be an obstacle. So the the U.S. is um, you know is resisting joining various uh, AI AI um, collaborations and agreements that include binding commitments. So um, I'm afraid that we've got a lot of work in the United States before any before the before the United States is willing to make any and enter into specific agreements that will restrain uh, AI companies. And there's a disconnect, I'd say, that you know there's a burden on us in the U.S. to to try to address this issue because there's a big disconnect between what the Biden administration says it wants to do to protect consumers, and I think they do, and some of the resistance um, or even affirmatively harmful efforts to try to undermine cooperation or other national government efforts to um, control and put in place appropriate protections around AI. For um, Although there's been some progress made. So for many years now, the US has been pushing provisions international trade agreements on so-called digital trade that are designed to restrict countries' ability to adopt their own regulations, um, specifically to get access to source code so they can see if algorithms are working fairly and to require data to be held um, within national borders. And the U.S. has pulled back. So the U.S. has advocated these uh, pro big tech positions and trade agreements for quite many years and has now pulled back and is no longer doing that. So we've made some progress, but so far, um, getting the US to agree to affirmative commitments on AI internationally, we're not yet there. Can't speak about well, Canada. This, yes. Well, Canada's, Canada's its own situation. Um, Scott, this was also uh, addressed partially to you. So how do you feel about that? Just as you're thinking about it, I'll say that, you know, Rob's, Rob, your assessment is is clearly very well informed. In India, uh, India just last week uh, announced a sort of U-turn on AI regulation um, and a, a kind of change in its approach where previously the approach was voluntary and, and now will be requiring tech companies to get government permission before launching um, AI models. So political change is possible, I suppose, and, and possibly with an election in the US this year, we might see something different. But I think, uh, Rob, your assessment is, is most likely the most sensible here. Scott, uh, did you have a perspective on that? Oh, Scott, I think you're on mute. Sorry. I guess I'm the one who wins the prize for messing that up. Bueno, todos estamos trabajando for customers. Like, that's the bottom line. Like, I, you know, Rob articulated, you know, the problems that could exist around, around making more durable commitment type things. But like in the meantime, you know, for instance, you, you talked about the things the Biden administration has done. Like we have joined and have signed up for the White House voluntary AI commitments. You know, we're part of the U.S. Artificial Intelligence Safety Institute. Like these things, you know, we think are good and and we love the way the thinking that's there and and how we can help and contribute to creating a safer environment for AI. And then as it comes to scams very specifically, like I, I said, we are 
constantly working to try to get uh, you know, the cooperation and things set up so we can share. Rob brought up there are some legal hurdles there, but when it comes to something so obviously impacting, we do find folks more receptive to being able to figure something out. Um, and so we're hopeful to continue down that path because we because we got to stop the bad stuff at the source. We got to stop scams at the source uh, to make this go away. Thanks. Thanks for that. Um, so we've got a question that's coming through. I'm going to try and open it up to the uh, the person to actually speak. We have Grace Matabula, who's the uh, program manager of the Alliance for Innovative Regulation. Uh, Grace, we're going to try and unmute you to ask a question directly. Um, so if if you can come through, we'll be able to to hear you. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Okay, so the question that I posed was actually answered already. It was really around equipping vulnerable consumers um, in LMIC against the Gen AI scams, but I've been answered for that one. Thank you, Stephen. Good, I'm glad to, glad to hear that, thanks. We will, uh, we will lower your hat. Um, so one of the other things that has come through here has been uh, the role of data storage and whether that can be used to help consumers. Um, so data being stored in different, uh, at local, in, in local servers uh, and, and might be helpful in, I think, uh, I guess the question is about uh, identifying um, possible patterns of manipulation, uh, which I think one of the speakers also uh, also talked about. Um, Rob, can I can I ask for a little bit more explanation on the uh, on the trade policy? Um, because there's there's clearly a, a bigger issue which relates to the problem or the challenge or the opportunity of generative AI, and the US has seen um, trade negotiations as as a place where they can. You know, protect uh, their their own industries. Could you unpack that a bit for for people that are not necessarily familiar with um, with the issue? Like, what does that actually mean? What does it look like? And where is where are civil society uh, concerned about that? Sure. Um, well, as I said, this this is a positive story from our point of view because there's been a significant shift in U.S. policy in just the last several months on behalf of the Biden administration. Um, but for the last many years, the US has pushed a series of measures in international trade agreements that are called digital trade. Um, the primary space where this has been, has been debated is at the World Trade Organization, but it's in, in proposed as well in regional free trade agreements and in bilateral free trade agreements. Sometimes it comes up in agreements that aren't that do not have the U.S. as a party, uh, even though I think the U.S. was the originator of these provisions. And there, there's several of them, but the two most notable are the ones that I referenced. One has to do um, with whether or not a government can require corporations to share their source code with them, which is specifically important if you wanted to do an audit, if a government wanted to do an audit of an AI system, either one that was making decisions, an algorithm making decisions, or an audit over a generative AI system and how it's performing. You need to see the underlying code. The US has been arguing for rules that would prohibit governments from doing that on the grounds that the material should be treated as proprietary. The other key provision the US has been pushing had a run around data flows, which is to say whether countries could require that data stay within their borders. This was a particularly big issue, for example, in the dispute between the US and the EU over the, over the European Union's privacy protections. And the idea was, well, if we let this, if we let European data go into the United States, we don't really trust that our privacy protections will be respected. We wanted to stay in the United States and a whole system was built up to deal with that conflict. But that illustrates the kind of issue that's at stake. So in these trade agreements, countries make commitments and they are they rest effectively restrict 
what countries can do with their own regulations. And the U.S. has been trying to impose this on other countries, as I said, through a variety of trade fora, trade negotiations, and in the last many months has now backed down from that policy and is no longer um, trying to uh, force those provisions into trade deals and no longer trying to demand that countries give up these regulatory powers. Thanks for that explanation. Um, the I think it's helpful to to digress there slightly, just because it goes to show that uh, this is not just you know a problem or a challenge of one issue of scams uh, and and misinformation, uh, but rather it speaks to the whole digital economy and how many of these issues intersect with each other um, and uh, and affect consumers in different ways. Sometimes visible like this issue, and sometimes invisible through through trade agreements so thanks for explaining that uh, to the group here um i'm going to uh, move on to the call to action which uh, from our panel uh, in preparation for well consumer rights day on friday so this is the beginning of uh four sessions that will be that we are bringing together under, under this topic tomorrow we've got a discussion on responsible data data policy for ai and what that looks like we're really digging into some of the issues that have been talked about on thursday we'll be presenting um, results from an exercise that members have participated in to test three generative ai chatbots and what those members have found uh, and some of the uh, the challenges and opportunities that they uncovered, including many of the things that we've talked about uh, today, before we end on Friday with with a celebration of, of World Consumer Rights Day. So thinking about uh, that opportunity on Friday, the, the global membership of Consumers International celebrating World Consumer Rights Day, I will ask the panel to share their call to action uh, for that group. So I'll start with Haley. please tell us, what is your call to action for fair and responsible AI for consumers? Well, I think, you know, authorities, uh, you know, like us need to continue the, the hard work in this space and um, we'll be publishing a, a, a report um, next month, which um, I, I hope many of you have the, have the chance to read, but it's, it's just incredibly vital that authorities like the CMA continue to be vigilant, keep developments in the market under review and make sure that we are kind of guiding towards those those good outcomes, but I wanted to share that that one of the things that, that has struck me is actually one of the very earliest comments that was made, and you'll see I've been sort of furiously making notes while people have been talking. It's just been such a wonderful, rich discussion, but it was just that reminder not to just think about the economic harms here, although they are really significant and um, you know impactful, but that psychological impact and the distress that it can cause to consumers and somebody i was quite struck used the word shame and i hadn't really thought about it in that in that context before and i i just found that as a really good sobering thought that we're not just dealing with numbers here you know we're dealing with real people who are you know experiencing a lot of of, of psychological harm and distress as well as and the obviously important economic issue and impact as well. And I just wanted to share that really, that really sort of struck me as part of the of, of the discussion. So, so really, thank you um, for that. Thanks to you, Haley. I think Scott, it was you that, that used that term. So, why don't we ask you for your call to action next? Um, yeah, sure. Uh, thanks for the excellent discussion. Much like Haley, I certainly have learned a bunch here. Um, and there are two themes I want to leave this kind of audience with of consumer advocates. Like one, you know, let's continue to work together to break down these information intelligence silos. And so we can find ways to stop scams at the source. So AI doesn't even become a player. Like let's stop. And then let's also find ways to help consumer avoid the scams and recover from them. Uh, stop the shame uh, when they need it the most. Um, there's a lot of work to do. I know, we know, I can't, we can't do it by ourselves. <laughs> and, um, as the panelists have all mentioned, it's a, it's going to be an effort and that we'll need to continue to push on all the levers, uh, government, private sector, <laughs> advocacy groups to try to get this so we can get to this 
I don't think it's, you know, we got this vision of creating a world where consumers can navigate their lives uh, confident they're not going to fall victim to scams. Like that's where we want to get. Everybody would be in a better spot if we can get there. And we're, we want to work with others to get there. You know, I'll make the plug for our blog at, at aboutamazon.com. Go there, read. You can see how we're thinking about it and engage with us. Give us the feedback. If we got it wrong, let us know. Um, if we reach out of hand. We're happy to, to work with others. We're going to be at the Global Anti-Scam Alliance uh, Summit this summer. We're working with Consumer Internationals on Stop Scams UK. So we're out there, happy to work with others. We can, with both, be hard, but we can we can get to this. We can fix it. Thanks. We'll go next to Rob for your call to action. Hard to distill it to one one theme. You um, can make several. But I, I guess what I would say that is that you know scams are a very specific kind of problem, which I think almost by definition don't offer really satisfactory answers. Um, we got to do all the things that we can that we, the best we can. But uh, as Rocio was saying, like we're dealing, we're really talking about criminal elements that are creative and incentivized to keep trying to stay ahead of whatever controls are in place. So I don't think it's ever going to be really satisfactory and for sure scams and fraud have existed since the beginning of the first barter economy uh, and they're not going to stop anytime soon but i also wanted to just encourage folks to also think outside of the world of scams about the new transformation of the marketplace that is happening and going to continue to happen with the spread and dissemination of generative ai tools and i think those changes are going to be really profound. I'm troubled by them because I, I think that the because the way things have played out, companies have sort of let this go too fast before we have regulatory controls in place. Um, but now it's the reality that we have. And I think this is going to affect um, it's going to affect the, the OECD countries. It's going to affect low and middle income countries. It's going to affect everyone. I don't think that there's escape from it. And my encouragement would be to not be intimidated about the novelty of the problems and challenges that are being um, presented by generative AI and to really lean in in every country and in international fora to try to address these issues. A lot of the problems that we're gonna face are foreseeable and we should get ahead of them. There's gonna be some unforeseeable problems that we're gonna have to grapple with as they happen, but we should be, I think, very aggressive and pursuing measures, um, it's not our fault that the technology has been let loose, in my view, too early. Um, but we shouldn't hold back based on needing to have perfect understanding of the technology, which no one has, perfect understanding of the harms, which no one has, or perfect ideas for solutions. Um, we should be very proactive and precautionary in the kind of things we're pushing. My No Consumers International is available as a resource to everyone to help think through those challenges. I'll add that we are a public citizen as well. I'm happy to share what we know or work with people and learn from people um, for how we deal with the, the, the new sets of threats we're going to face across the world. So my call to action is to, to be really engaged and don't be shy. Don't, as consumer advocates, not to let our uncertainty or some of our doubts about our technological sophistication deter us from demanding protections. And last thing to say, I, I, one of the points in the, in the chat was about the need for redress. I think that's pretty hard in the case of scams, but thinking about redress and liability when it comes to the mainstream economy really should be at the forefront of, we think, of what we're thinking about because we're not going to be able to solve every problem, but we should be able to establish that when consumers are wronged, they've got a right to remedy um, against uh, mainstream economic players that they can identify and should be able to hold accountable in national and international systems. Thanks very much, Rob. Rocio, let's let's end with your call to action. So before I put my call to action, I just want to build something that Rob said there about a scan that will never be satisfactory in dealing with this. We will never stop it because there will always be more innovations that these criminals will come up with to 
but we need to do something about it and keep anything that we put in place to protect consumers keep, keep evolving. Because I can tell you, scams have always been there, but since the digital economy, they're having a huge increase. Now with Generative AI, we will probably see a curve like this, which is um, even more important that we really uh, have action on this. And I said, keep evolving that tools and all things. My call for action is, um, I would like to see tech companies regulators and government using generative AI to actually deal with the problems that generative AI creates, deal with the harms that generative AI allowed, amplified. So why, when governments put a pot of money there for generative AI, why they cannot say, this is to generate new tools that to, uh, to protect consumers or protect citizens. So I want to see more creation of uh, more creativity, more efforts in using generative AI for good. Thanks, Rocio. I think that's a, a lovely way to end it. Um, it's What's coming through is that this is clearly a tech-driven issue. It's not necessarily about the tech. We've got the, the we've, we have frameworks for consumer protection that are well-established and be built on. Uh, we have the opportunity for collaboration, whether that's with the private sector or within civil society, or even at the uh, at the level of of both, to to use technology to identify and mitigate the the problem. Uh, and I will also mention the importance of persistence, which I think all of you have alluded to as well, is to to not give up on this on this huge problem, which we've talked about and really underlined today both emotional and financial, not give up on, on addressing it because together we, we are clearly stronger and we can have, we can make a difference. So thank you everyone for such um, direct and, and optimistic calls to action, uh, which we'll take forward during this week. Uh, we will highlight again the, the remaining sessions that we have. And I think there's a, a slide showing uh, showing what you can join and listen in on uh, we have sessions every day uh, of this week covering data policy, the consumer experience of generative AI, and uh, our celebration on Friday. I'll also mention that Consumers International has a group of uh, almost 30 of its members that have signed a statement to stop online scams, which was uh, published at our Global Congress in December. For those of you that are interested, members or otherwise, in supporting that statement, uh, please get in touch with us, and in particular, my colleague Holly Hamlet, who I think uh, will will add her email address to the chat uh, for those of you that would like to reach out. This is a, a critical resource for both um, members and the the private sector to understand how consumers are uh, facing this problem and what can be done about it. So, uh, please um, join the scams group and, and see. Uh, see what else we can we can do to uh, to address this issue. Uh, I will end by just taking a moment to thank the panelists again, uh, Rocio, Rob, Haley, and Scott. Thank you so much for being here, for helping members understand this issue, and uh, and delivering such a compelling and powerful call to action. I hope to see many of you again during the course of this week, and to look forward to celebrating World Consumer Rights Day with all of you on Friday. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.